Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vibhor. Uh, I'm from NASCOM. And thanks for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, the today's webinar is part of our uh, product management series in partnership with SAP. Uh, today, uh, we are going to talk about go-to-market strategies and how a uh, variety of the cloud platforms can be used to uh, uh, for effective go-to-market, uh, for which we have uh, Mr. Ashok Muniratnam uh, with us. He heads SAP Cloud Platform for uh, uh, Asia Pacific and Japan. Uh, his contact coordinates are given here. Uh, I will not take much of a time. Just, just a reminder. After a, after this webinar, we will have a small uh, feedback form for you to share your feedback with us, so that we can, you know, uh, we can effectively, uh, you know, enhance the uh, quality of the content and the webinar experience for every one of you. Uh, Ashok, over to you. Thanks, Vibor. Um, I would like to welcome uh, you know, <clears throat> people who are joining on this uh, webinar. Um, I'm excited to actually share some of the uh, go-to-market strategy and uh, you know the planning uh, that we do. Uh, specifically on uh, platform as a service. Uh, so uh, just a, a quick bit of introduction about myself. So um, I am actually heading the um, a business development team for SAP Cloud Platform, which is the PaaS platform as a service from SAP uh, for Asia Pacific and Japan. And uh, my background is, uh, you know, I, I started as a developer and then uh, I went through um, most of my experience is all around the platform. So when I say platform, that comprises of uh, application development, uh, databases, um, disaster recovery strategies, uh, middleware, mobile, um, you know, some of the newer technologies like IoT, blockchain, uh, machine learning, and so on and so forth. So, um, so that's that's my background, and. Uh, <clears throat> So let me jump straight into the, the content. So, uh, you know, before I begin, what I would like to do is to give a little bit of, um, you know, overview on what I'm going to talk about. I kind of divided the, the content into three broad topics. One is what's kind of going on in the, you know, um, in the globally in terms of technology, right? What are the current trends that are happening and why is it important from a product strategy point of view? And secondly, you know, how businesses are transforming. I think digital transformation is a very widely used term nowadays. Um, everybody tries, tried, uh, you know, to move from their traditional business model to um, uh, using the digital. So I, I'll give a few, few examples of, uh, you know, uh, I picked up a few industries, right? Uh, just to give a flavor of that. And finally, you know, we'll talk about, you know, how do you, we build or how someone can build a, a go-to-market strategy with a, a platform as a service kind of product, right? So that will be my agenda. So if you look at the, you know, the current trends, <clears throat> I think, um, you know, there is a huge, uh, you know, void, right? Because of the, uh, the gap, uh, you know, between the traditional businesses and the, you know, the businesses that want to leverage the digital. As a, as a means. So, um, you know, you can see that 29 companies fell off the Fortune 500 in 2015. And we know of many examples, right? And why people cannot, uh, you know, leverage, um, you know, their business or rather uh, why they are not making it relevant to the current, uh, you know, audiences, customers, technology, uh, business model. So, it, it is continuing to, uh, you know, be the trend, right? And then, um, yeah, Fortune 500 firms between 1955 and 2016, only 20% remains. So the rest, 88% has gone, right? They have, uh, you know, uh, they changed in different ways. Some of them disappeared, some of them got acquired, and so on and so forth. So, um, and 40% of today's Fortune 500 will be extinct in 2026. Although this is a bit of a predictive, 
um, you know, messaging, but uh, we can see how it is uh, uh, extending. One other interesting um, point that uh, I remember now is also um, the companies that uh, that were existed in 1955, the second pointer, right? So, um, you know, many of them have been, uh, you know, moved out of uh, what they were doing. So, so my our point is that <clears throat> we have to be relevant to the the times, right? So uh, we have to we have to be the, relevant to the customers. We have to be relevant to the business partners. Uh, we have to be relevant to the current technologies as well. If we are not, then you know <clears throat> we will be uh, moving out in one way or, or another. So this is another interesting aspect, right? So most of the CEOs that we see, they say, you know, the next three years are more critical than the past 50 years, right? So the pace of adoption, you know, has gone from uh, 10, many years, I mean, probably not 10 years nowadays, but we still see, uh, you know, the adoption going through uh, a massive cycle of period and uh, it's very serial, right? So you implement, uh, you know, one country, another country, and so on. So it is not a, a parallel uh, sort of thing yet. But now I think we see a lot more agility in that space. So people are not talking about development, uh, you know, I mean, uh, months. People are talking about weeks nowadays. Um, so that is another trend. So <clears throat> this is a kind, kind of, um, you know, uh, what currently is going on? I mean, uh, for the last uh, one, two years, we've been talking about this industry 4.0, mainly around, uh, you know, industrialization. I'll give you a quick example. I was in Korea some time back. So I met up with the this organization, which is a consortium of government and about 25,000 manufacturing companies. So they have uh, set up a model company um, you know, and then uh, they are trying to uh, get all these manufacturing companies to become, uh, you know, fully automated. So they have graded the companies as level one, level two, level three, and level four. Level one is the, you know, the basic automation. Level four is the 100% fully automized, uh, you know, uh, companies. And, uh, you know, uh, most of the companies are falling in the range between three and four in Korea. So the same example, uh, you know, there is a company uh, headquartered in Korea and they have a manufacturing plant, uh, you know, all over global, the 20 manufacturing plants. One of them is in India and India manufacturing plant is at level one. So that kind of tells us the story where we are, right? And obviously, you know, while we are lagging <clears throat> behind, that is also our opportunity, right? How we can basically move um, you know the automation levels, uh, and of course, it requires a lot of um, a lot of uh, factors to work together. But I am pretty sure that uh, we will actually uh, move this up. So part of that story would also comprise, you know, some of the technologies like you know cloud, private cloud in some cases, where you know the data residency is very important, and in-memory data. You know, uh, because nowadays you see. In-memory data has become very important because the real-time element uh, of the businesses are becoming so important, right? So if I take the same example as um, the manufacturing, so the supply chain is very important. So there are like, you know, 200 uh, companies that are supplying spare parts to you. If uh, you are not real-time connected to these people and know what kind of inventory they carry on, it's going to be very difficult for you to predict, you know, what's going to be your output, right? So um, things like that. So that's why in-memory technology has become very important. And of course, with the big data, machine learning, AI, deep learning, all those things also coming into play. So the next set of things that we are kind of now going through is big data, which I talked about earlier. IoT, again, it is very relevant for uh, many industries, especially manufacturing. Um, and then, you know, microservices based architecture. So, um, I mean, there are, there is an architecture that the people talk about, which is called as mode one and mode two. Mode one being your core applications, mode two is your, um, is your uh, agile layer where you can bring in all these new technologies uh, to build application quickly, right? So that's, so basically the link 
to the mode one and mode two is basically the microservice, right? And then 3D printing, which is widely, you know, uh, being used nowadays. Uh, and then the cloud platform, which is a platform as a service, sits in between SaaS, software as a service, and, um, you know, infrastructure as a service. So in the next wave, you see there are things like, you know, immersive technologies. I think AR, VR has become so common now. So an example that I saw recently was uh, an automotive company, car manufacturing company, you know, who allows you to uh, customize the car, right? So the, the color, the seats, um, you know, the steering wheel, your dashboard and stuff like that. So people can do all these things using the web, but uh, right now what they are trying to do is, you know, they are using the AR, VR technology. So you can not only see, but you can feel it. Like, you know, it's like, you wear the you know the gear and then you put all this you know a glo gloves which is connected and then you can kind of sit and feel how does the car feel right with the changed environment you know, changing the color changing the seats uh, changing your dashboard etc so i think it is going to be more and more of uh, that kind of thing that will evolve from the immersive technology right uh, i'll take a few other examples like um, you know the one of my favorite i i i'm always fascinated this about this topic which is quantum computing where you know we are trying to what the you know people are trying to do is to use a, a hydrogen atom and then you know um, use the oscillation of electrons and then tie the one and zero you know based on which side it is oscillating right uh, and then you know they are trying to build this Q, qpu so we have uh, cpu we have gpu we have a TPU, tensor processing unit, as well as now what we call as QPU, right? So this QPU, you know, the traditional, um, you know, uh, processors, CPUs are like, you know, it can process 1 billion, you know, per second, right? Instruction sets, for example. And the QPUs can go, you know, you can multiply 1 billion into a million. So it can handle simultaneously a million of those kind of things. So it is a fantastic technology for a parallel processing unit, um, but then it is not coming without any challenges, right? Because you know that uh, you know um, the the state of atom is very fragile, right? So I think you know the researchers are still trying to find build prototypes to make sure that you know um, how to handle that fragility of uh, of the atom. But this, these are things that are, you know, that will change the way how, you know, we operate today, right? Um, neuro, neuromorphic hardware is another one, which kind of, um, you know, mimic how neurons would work, right? Like our human, how our human brains would work. Whereas the current uh, ML, AI technology, deep, deep, deep learning and all, it basically requires, uh, you know, a lot of data, you know, to test the, the models fundamentally. But, uh, you know, we are trying to uh, make it even more smarter and then, you know, think like how the human brain, you know, thinks, right? So that's the set of um, you know, things that is being worked out in the neuromorphic hardware. And then in the horizon, you know, uh, there are a few other things like, you know, brain computer interface, 4D printing, smart dust. Yeah, 4D printing especially is, uh, again, a very fascinating topic just because, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, shape shifting uh, material so this is a combination of bringing in you know material different material as well because the process wise is going to be the same like 3d printing layer by layer you know the printer will keep printing stuff but based on the environment around the material the properties of the material can change for example the color of the material can change right depending on you know uh, a certain uh, change in the environment. The uh, the other property that can be changed is basically, you know, uh, giving you um, the temperature, right? The required temperature based on where you are. And, and I, I saw somewhere I read, uh, you know, people are trying to develop uh, an invisible clock kind of thing, right? Um, so it's basically about how you emit, you know, the light based on your environment, so making you invisible. So there are a lot of interesting stuff that's going on in this area as well. Um, you know, 
and the other smart dust is basically um, you know it's a mini miniaturization of uh, you know all the um, iot sensor you know capabilities that you can build in in a very small uh, compact it's like less than a millimeter sort of thing that so when you make such as uh, you know uh, small component you know which can actually do a lot of these things um, you know it's easy to embed in anything like robotics in machines in you know anything that you want right um, so this, these are all some of the examples that I just wanted to give you a flavor um, so just moving on um, so the business models right there are like variety of business models that are evolving so i'm just giving you a you know a flavor of that as well so uh, subscription model is a very common model that uh, you know you pay a, a subscription fee on a monthly basis so you don't need to basically own right anything so you can just subscribe and use the service that is a freemium model which i believe all of us uh, are using and then um, you know the free model marketplace model so there are quite a lot of these different models that are available, right? So this completely disrupts the way how, um, you know, customers are consuming the products, right? Or the services. Um, so uh, people will not going forward, you know, buy that is anything uh, would require a upfront investment. That is very, very clear, right? So I just wanted to give you that, um, you know, so uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the transformation. So the transformation, you know, in you know, I've been working with many you know enterprise customers uh, across uh, APJ. Um, so I, I kind of get to hear from them, you know, what does really the digital transformation means, right, to them? So some say, yeah, it is something they want to do incremental and don't want to do it on a big bang approach. And some people say, no, this cannot be done uh, on an incremental, right? So there are two uh, school of thoughts. Uh, but again, uh, here, what we are saying is incremental change is not transformation, right? So this is what some of the you know uh, people believe. Because the problem with this approach is that uh, when you do it incrementally, um, you know, if first of all, not only it takes time and uh, it doesn't change the people's uh, perception and also it doesn't change the way how they work, right? So it has to be uh, done uh, at a slightly bigger level uh, from a top-down approach, um, you know, which would make it effective. Otherwise, the, the rate of success, uh, you know, is very low uh, compared to the other approach you take. So th that is one um, thing that I kind of keep hearing from uh, people from different sections. Um, and again, you know, there are different type of uh, digital transformation we talk about, right? So uh, customer experience can be one of them. Uh, so if you know, uh, nowadays, a lot of people interact with their, um, you know, service providers through uh, things like mobile uh, over a phone call or they use their app in the mobile or sometimes they go to the website and then, you know, uh, interact with them by lodging a complaint or whatever. So um, the channels have become very wide nowadays, right? So uh, people, I've seen people interact in Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, and so on. So it has become multi-channel, right? So that's one thing that has changed drastically. And of course, you know, the your website or your application becomes the primary, you know, way to connect with your with your consumers or your customers. So so that's why. This can be a very important uh, area that some people wanted to focus on. So customer satisfaction through customer experience, right? The second one is operational. So this is more, um, you know, a COO or a CIO driven type of uh, transformation. So improving efficiency, improving DevOps or ag agility, um, you know, business processes and so on. Uh, the third type is uh, cost-centric digital transformation. So typically driven by CFOs. Um, so they typically talk about, you know, cutting cost uh, or improving the, you know, bottom line, you know, things like that. Um, so we see that um, a lot of these infrastructure driven conversation or even moving to the cloud from an on-premise world, um, you know, comes under this section because they can readily cut down 
you know, their assets in terms of hardware and so on. So when it comes to renewals, right? So people just move to a, a SaaS or a PaaS models. Um, and the last one is of course the business model transformation. So this is about building new uh, business model, new revenue streams, uh, looking at market share, you know, or entering new markets. So things like that, right? So this is like a very broad, uh, you know, agenda driven typically by the CEOs, right? So you can see that, you know, all of this, you know, uh, can happen from different angles. Um, but yeah, it, it's all about, you know, how do you transform the way, uh, you know, you do business. So let's talk about a couple of examples here. So uh, let me take an example of an automotive company, right? So automotive companies are fundamentally changing the way how they are engaging. So if you look at, uh, you know, the, the four bullets that I put up here, you know, uh, the connected, what does connected means, right? Connectivity offers new possibilities in comfort, safety, and entertainment, right? So automotive companies innovate through their digital service platforms, right? They also, uh, you know, wanted to uh, provide an end-to-end -end service while you are in the vehicle. Um, development of a car does not stop with production nowadays, right? It goes beyond, um, it, beyond the typical life cycle of it, um, you know, and then they wanted to engage, you know, the customers on an ongoing basis uh, to understand their needs and fulfill those things. And autonomous, uh, autonomous driving, I think a lot of people you, you would be following that, I suppose, right? Although I think it is still quite a bit of uh, a distance that we need to go. Maybe 2035 is what people are saying that uh, fully autonomous vehicles would be available. But I think a lot of work is going on in getting there. Uh, shared mobility and services is basically, you know, uh, the scales of economy. It kind of simplifies our everyday life, gives us more flexibility, especially in the urban areas. Um, so the mobility service providers create intelligent mo mobile solution using applications like, um, you know, uh, flexible car sharing services or even other on-demand services, um, you know, to use the existing fleet, right? Uh, the last one is a digitalization. So innovative products, including the digital, uh, using the digital technologies, um, you know, uh, like electrical uh, vehicle, right? Uh, that, that can be one uh, that is quite widely spoken nowadays, um, you know, because it not only is green, uh, it's also clean and provides, uh, you know, uh, quiet uh, electrical vehicles, uh, both from air and noise pollution, right? So this will be a big thing. So, uh, you know, the outcome of all these four, you know, key initiatives that I see in the automotive space is that, yeah, building smart products using digital and then IoT driven factories, for example, and then uh, bringing in the deep learning AI sort of thing in the autonomous vehicle building. And, uh, you know, shared mobility is about, uh, you know, um, building uh, mobile applications or even uh, building a community, right? Using a collaboration platform possibly, right? So things, things like that are evolving in this space. So let's go to, um, you know, banking, for example. I, I'll touch upon three industries, uh, you know, to give you that flavor. Um, so in the banking industry, you know, you can see that um, there are a couple of things that we talk about. One is, uh, you know, uh, the digital banking and then um, you know new ecosystems and uh, margin you know pressure typically now uh, coming across from different so let me give you a, a short brief on each of those so digital expectations or digital banking basically is uh, you know setting the bar higher using the digital interactions so the customers are comparing their digital experience right uh, from other fintechs typically um, and competing with the bank's digital experiences. So um, it is still a bit of a gap, I would say, with the traditional banks are already, uh, they are trying, many of them are trying to bridge that gap, uh, but uh, cloud solutions, you know, is one way that can quickly roll out, you know, th this gap and bringing in some of these newer technologies like AI and so on, right? And um, new ecosystems, so what does it mean? So instead of banks, you know, competing with uh, some of the other, um, you know, um, companies which does fintech or you know, um, type of companies, 
uh, they should be able to collaborate with them and then uh, you know work out a new business model instead of uh, competing with them because um, I, I don't think they will be able to uh, replicate uh, what uh, you know these fintechs are doing uh, where they're kind of bringing in uh, new business models right margin so again this is an outcome of uh, the new entrance in this market where uh, people are seeing that uh, you know um, they can do similar transaction a simple example let me give you if let us say you're doing a fund transfer between one bank uh, in a different country to another bank in a different country right so the cost of uh, you know the fund transfer is very heavy today right just because you have to pay a huge amount of uh, you know a processing fee or a commission to the bank both banks in one form or another but nowadays you see there are a lot of fintechs that are offering this this kind of service at a very low cost right um, you know they get, they they take a, a percentage of your transaction value and then you know they provide this so instead of banks competing with them right you can they can actually participate and then collaborate with them and do it so this is the sort of margin pressure they are, they are exposed to uh, the last one is the regulatory and compliance standard so this is a big thing because uh, as um, you know uh, the different countries I keep actually uh, releasing newer regulatory requirements. Uh, you know, it becomes uh, you know very difficult for the banks to actually uh, adhere to these kind of things. So uh, things like you know PSD, revised payment service directives. Um, so these are all you know European Union directives, which kind of um, you know manage that because. Um, you know, we deal with a lot of European banks as well. So this is just an example. And again, different regions, different countries have their own regulatory compliance. So what people can do here is basically, you know, use again, some of these technologies and solve this problem, right? I'll give you one more example, which is on the uh, consumer uh, or a retail uh, type of industry. So selling online channels, uh, I think this is, you know, uh, this has become very, very effective now, right? I think we are seeing companies uh, both in, in India and abroad coming here and then doing stuff. Um, bond Digital, some companies are, you know, uh, born with, um, you know, the digital, using the digital technologies and they are very, very agile. They can move very quickly, change their, um, you know, business model, you know, uh, or anything that requires in their business very quickly. And um, the other thing is uh, the Gen X and Gen Y buyers. So now you see that there are a lot of younger buyers, right? So how do you cater for them, you know, you know products and solutions? Um, the last mile logistics, uh, which is like, you know, uh, which is very important, right? When you order something, you wanted that in the next day, 24 hours. So 48 hours in the past, this seems to be a very, very agile way of delivering stuff. But nowadays, I think uh, it has become the hygiene, basic hygiene. Anything goes beyond 48 hours, people are like frowning, right? So I just want to give you this a uh, little bit of flavor from an industry perspective. Let's go into the, um, you know, uh, the go-to-market strategy. So <clears throat> see, for a product strategy, I think uh, there are a couple of things that, uh, you know, uh, that forms the basis of it, right? One is, of course, uh, thinking about uh, you know a slightly longer term vision, strategically, um, taking into account some of the technology uh, you know that is evolving. Um, so that's the first. Second is empathize uh, as a as a customer, right? Because if we are not able to empathize what uh, a customer would want in the product, then uh, you know it's not going to be very effective. So that is a very very important aspect. How do we empathy, uh, empathize a customer's need? User experience. I think user experience has proved, uh, you know, to be a killer, right? So um, I think uh, iPhone is probably always being talked about as one of them, right? So people do not need to be trained how to use an application. That's a very important statement, I think. Um, I think we all talk about the enterprise grade platform. But I think for, when it comes to experience, it has to be a consumer grade, right? Nobody need to tell them how to use. It. So it should be that easy. So that's what the great user experience means. And uh, positive attitude and execution, you know. So um, let me jump into, you know, the, you know, the product as a platform, as a service. I talked earlier about, 
you know how platform as a service sits in between infrastructure and you know uh, software as a service so as you can see in this slide you know it, it kind of bridges uh, these two extreme worlds uh, where um, see if you think about i'll give you an example if you think about um, a set of let's say uh, retail companies right uh, let's say they all use the same application in the cloud right so how do they differentiate uh, from one business to another because if there is no differentiation then why would customer go to a versus b right there must be something you differentiate either you product you provide me with a better product you provide me with a better customer experience or you know any others right otherwise there's no differentiation so the differentiation comes from differentiating your business processes end of the day right so you got to have something different let's say your pricing strategy is different or your, your product model is different uh, so when you say product model is different you know that means you got to deal with a different set of raw raw materials instead of company a company b uses a different set of raw materials or a different set of manufacturing pr process different type of um, you know pricing strategy so all this will have to come some from somewhere right so which is why i think the platform as a service plays a very important role because this is where you can create your own ip your own differentiation yeah so that's why this is important i think um, you know the the trend that is moving in the cloud is basically serverless right so uh, people do not need to worry about you know uh, you know scaling for example so cloud you know in basic it offers that elasticity but I think this goes beyond uh, a basic statement of elasticity. How would you do it, right? So this is how we, do, we will do it. Serverless and function as a service and so on, right? So this kind of offers, um, you know, the way to seamlessly uh, grow and shrink based on your needs. Um, so that's how I think, uh, you know, you can see in this, uh, people who have, uh, you know, responded to the, um, you know, uh, to the survey. So, um, so this is again, a, you know, a Gartner's statement. By 2020, 75 percent of application purchases supporting digital business will not be uh, will be built, not buy, right? So now we are kind of going back to the, you know, the development paradigms again, right? So people wanted to actually build and differentiate rather than, you know, buy. Of course, the the commodity ones where you you won't really you know want to uh, make a big differentiation you you can go and buy a off the shelf product uh, but again there's a, some amount of that differentiation will have to come in so uh, one other thing that uh, I, I would also touch upon is that you know multi cloud so what does multi cloud mean so multi cloud means that you know um, you should be able to uh, easily, you know, seamlessly move between one vendor to another vendor, right? So, uh, for example, if I create an application in, you know, in one vendor, uh, in a one cloud environment, I should be easily be able to move to another environment because the, this will give uh, options for, you know, the customers to actually look at, um, uh, you know, uh, any cloud vendor that they want to go with. Uh, and uh, you know it kind of reduces the vendor lock-in and also it kind of gives a single contractual partnership based on what their relationship with the with the cloud vendor right so this is one aspect that i feel is important and the second is um, you can see that uh, you know how this multi-cloud might might work because if you look at uh, you know all the you know uh, big vendors like Amazon, Azure, GCP, and IBM Cloud, so fundamentally they provide infrastructure as a service. So from a platform as a service perspective, ideally it should be agnostic to all of this and sit above so that you know people can actually build application and then they can move to any infrastructure as a vendor, right? So that that would be a, a, a scenario. So. Um, just going back to uh, you know one fundamental question about why platform as a service so as i said earlier agility is key right how quickly you can respond to your uh, business need is going to be very very important as i said in the monolithic world you know um, you know people have uh, you know built applications and then you know when they want to apply a, a patch or an up upgrade right to the system it used to take like weeks to months, you know, depending on how extensive is your system. 
and because of uh, you know so much of time it takes right people don't want to do the updates uh, you know very often so um, you know in some of the customers i spoke to them is that if they do once a year a system update it is considered agile right so if you look at uh, in the current you know world i think agile means uh, releasing a feature every day that's 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 agile so you can see there is a huge gap right um, so that's why you know agility is key and also i think um, instead of uh, i think you can see the chart on the left hand side it says 72% of them keep the lights on in the past right and only 28% drive the business innovation now i think it is completely you know uh, reversed uh, people like to keep the lights on to the minimal and then try to focus on you know building new capabilities to differentiate the business right so that's the kind of change that's going on and also at the right hand side chart you can see that it talks about the traditional on premise system architecture so you move from you know um, uh, uh, development to test to uh, production and so on i think this is still kind of continuing uh, but i think the issue is you know uh, about um, you know trying to innovate within that uh, you know system core system for example right so that's not feasible anymore because if you are going to do an update only once a year and you know how can you bring in uh, agility and innovation into it so that is not possible so which is why i think um, you know we, we are talking about the bimodal it uh, which i'll come to uh, with shortly so um, i think you can see in this uh, ap applications and you know the um, agile application surrounding the core it kind of separated right um, and then you can bring in that uh, you know newer uh, applications in using the using the platform as a service right so that's the kind of uh, you know bimodal that you're talking about the one on the left is basically the mode 1 platform where you have all your core applications and then on the right hand side you see the cloud platform which will help you to bring in the new technologies and then build you know application that you can release every week you know uh, or every day even if you want to so that's the sort of um, you know things that are happening um so i, I touched upon this uh, in the, you know previously which is like building in this two war two worlds right so if you look at this chart it says one side it's the degree of change and the other one is the pace of change so in the degree of change you see that um, you know you got to live in you know two worlds right um you know while you 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 want to keep your focus on your um you know running your business at the same time you need to innovate as well so these are the two worlds that you got to juggle around and uh, taking the bold step is like you know um basically you are trying to disrupt your your business using you know the technology right and the the bottom ones that you see low risk moves um you know you can kind of uh, choose you know what are the place that you want to uh, you want to what are the use cases that you want to use to and the second one is how quickly you can build that so you can kind of um, you know uh, put um, you know the use cases in these four buckets and then see how you can basically you know move um, with the agile uh, platform yeah so i can i talked about this as well so uh, if you go to the people who are maintaining this uh, you know the core applications they will say never touch my system because they know that the moment you touch it it's going to take another three months to six months to do a regression testing to make sure that everything works but uh, if you talk about people from an innovation side they'll say i will release a feature every day right so these are two different worlds that uh, we got to live in <clears throat> so i think um, you know uh, the entire conversation is about moving, um, you know, uh, in terms of um, this agile methodology. So how does, how does it work? So nowadays we see this, uh, you know, uh, cycle of uh, ideation and then, you know, build a minimum viable product. So it doesn't need to be extensive. Um, as long as it can meet the minimum requirements, you build this minimum viable product. And then you go through the innovation cycle and then keep releasing the new features in the application, right? So this is what I think uh, we have been experiencing. Uh, we have been working on 
for multiple customers. You've been kind of building this. Uh, we call this as a prototype, but I think this is also relevant. You know, whenever you build any product, right? This is go. This has to be your product strategy because gone are the days where you can build an application uh, or a solution or a product which takes one year, two years, right? That is gone. So we got to be really quick, nimble, fast. So that, you know, there is another thing that I, I keep hearing, which is fail fast. So you build something, doesn't work, fail. Yeah, that's perfectly okay, move on. Uh, and then try with the next idea, right? So if you have to do that, you have to be really agile. Otherwise, um, you, know, you know, with the market that is moving so fast, you know, you, 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 you cannot survive. Uh, uh, yeah, I think this is kind of reinforcing the same message, right? Um, you know, releasing is hard in the monolithic core application, and then releasing is easy in the cloud, uh, in the cloud platform-based application, and then you release it often. So you don't need to wait, right? Um, so that's the kind of, uh, you know, uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery is what I think uh, people are looking into. Um, <clears throat> So this is basically, you know, infusing technology uh, together with the business process. Because, you know, what I have noticed, uh, you know, observed in my, you know, uh, since I started this cloud-based uh, product line, you know, go to market about three years back, is that there are a lot of technologies available in the market, right? So people can use very quickly some of these technology. It may be IoT, it may be machine learning, blockchain, whatever. But then after you solve your business problem using this technology, how do you make it business centric? So what is the end goal that you are solving, right? Are you solving, uh, because you got to equate that to, you know, um, into either some, some value, right? So what is the value you're going to um, get out of this? Is it going to be, um, you know, resulting in more revenue or is it uh, X number of, customers that are getting more satisfied. So end of the day, they will recommend it to more people or they will buy more from you. Or is it increasing your bottom line, right? Or is it increasing the uh, uh, revenue, uh, sorry, market share, you know, in the market? So what is the objective? So you've, you, have, you have to link, you know, whatever you're doing with the business processes, right? That is gonna be very, very important. Um, and of course, here we have kind of divided that into design-led innovation and then development operations, right? So in the design-led innovation, it's all about ideation, doing prototyping, blueprinting, and you know, uh, business case and so on. Because if you don't have those, uh, you know, elements into your thought process, it's not it's not going to be uh, you know very successful, right? Because only the top part, once you sort it out, then you come to the uh, the bottom part, which is about, you know, how do you develop a thing, right? And then uh, how do you iterate and then make it better and so on. So uh, this is a very important thing. How do you infuse the technology to the business? So I think we, we kind of talked about this, right? In this uh, chart, you can see that uh, the bimodal IT uh, basically represents the stable core, digital core, and then there is an agile edge around it. So the stable core basically, you know, uh, kind of follows the waterfall method in terms of development, right? So you go through this traditional thing like, you know, collect the requirements, build the, you know, design, uh, you know, the architecture, go through the implementation, verification, and then it goes into the maintenance after that, right? Um, this is the waterfall method. Whereas if you look at the, the agile, um, you know, in a cloud platform, for example, so you can see that, um, you know, it goes through an iterative method, and then you know you plan, you develop, you deploy, integrate, test, and release, and then go into again planning. So it keeps going through this continuous integration and continuous delivery, right? So this is the the change, the shift between um, the two different architectures. So this will also, um, you know, um, you know, kind of kind of involve the type of um, the type of skills that you would need, right? The, the skills that are required for the digital core can be completely different uh, as opposed to uh, what you would do in a cloud platform, for example, right? So in the old world, you know, people would be still using, you know, I don't know, .NET, Java, even ABAP, you know, in SAP world, 
uh, and so on and so forth, right? So that's the, the, the traditional digital core application. Whereas if you go into the, uh, the cloud platform, I think we are using things like Python, PHP, you know, the Docker and so on and so forth. So uh, the two different worlds, right? So there is the skill part also have to be addressed. And, uh, you know, the other thing that we would also would be able to do is to extend, you know, the core business application platform, right? So um, this, so there are a couple of things that you can do with the cloud platform. Typically, you can develop a whole new application or you can extend a fun some functionality from your existing core application. So you can extend at different level, like integration, user uh, experience, rules, events integration, data integration, and so on and so forth. So there are different ways to do it and different se segments that you can do it. Um, so this chart basically represents, you know, what are the different layers that you can go and do these extensions. Okay, so this is my last slide. Um, so watch out for, you know, uh, the ever-changing technology because uh, for me, you know, that's what excites me um, and fascinates me always. And, um, you know, I always try to keep abreast, um, you know, with all these things because, uh, you know, these are all very, very relevant because we are all living in this uh, technology world. So you got to be keep yourself abreast of this. And a platform as a service, as we saw, is a key development paradigm for application developers because it bridges, it differentiates, you know, the businesses between, um, you know, your competitors uh, or the customer's competitors in this case. So, um, so you can develop the standalone applications as a mode two application. Um, so we, we, we saw that bimodal IT where you have a digital core and then there is an agile layer surrounding it. I think every single enterprise have this, right? So they have a set of core application and then they have set up this uh, agile application. So if you take banking, there's a core banking. If you take telco, there is a core telco application which is predominantly billing, right? And so on and so forth. So every every customer would have this. So uh, th the mode two is gonna be very important how quickly you can actually develop these applications. So PaaS again is agnostic to infrastructure. So we saw, saw that uh, using the multi-cloud. So uh, it should be uh, you know agnostic to the infrastructure providers so that customers will have a choice of using it. And finally, you know, you got to make your product uh, business relevant, right? Uh, the business context is very important. Um, so that is uh, my last slide with a summary. So, um, so Ibor, I will uh, open up for any questions. Um, hi, so thank you, uh, Ashok. Uh, it was um, it was a great presentation, I must say. Um, so far, I'm waiting for some questions. Uh, uh, guys, if you have any questions, you can write in the chat box and uh, you know, Ashok can answer these. Uh, if there is no question, we uh, will log out in next uh, uh, few uh, next few minutes. Uh, just a reminder, the next webinar in the series would be on uh, 15th of uh, uh, 15th of November. And uh, this will be about the customer acquisition and retention. <clears throat> and the information will uh, information to register and all will come to you shortly. So uh, I see um, a first question I show for you. Sure. Um, it says, is digital marketing the best thing to work on? Uh, just uh, uh, repeating the question. I think so the question, question is, is uh, from the, yeah. uh, I think from a perception of go to market is uh, from uh, from a marketing point of view. So yeah. for, for for further days uh, uh, and uh, so people are. I think people are suggesting whether they should go by uh, the digital marketing way or traditional marketing way or as okay. business is transforming digitally. So is the right. digital mar yeah. marketing is the best way to go? Yeah, I think this is also changing, right? Because, you know, uh, I, 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 you know, SAP, uh, at SAP, we also have our own marketing, 
you know, which is also changing. I can tell, but also I have interacted with many customers, you know, who are also, you know, changing. So as I said earlier, the customers are very, uh, you know, uh, informative nowadays, right? So they know where to look out for information. So they do a lot of pre-work before, you know, uh, beforehand uh, on uh, on this kind of topic. So uh, I think the digital, it's changing. I, I'm not saying that this is completely changed uh, to digital, uh, but I think it's in the transition phase right now. So uh, I would say that uh, it's like, you know, uh, 60% uh, traditional marketing and then 40% is digital. Uh, that's what I'm seeing. And then I, it is going to kind of, you know, grow, right? More and more digital because we see that, uh, you know, the your, uh, you know, product presents, your company present in the digital world is going to be a very, very important aspect of it. So I think this is a changing, you know, uh, area. Um, yeah, my sense is, yeah, that, that's uh, growing right now from the traditional way to digital. Yeah, uh, even uh, from a marketing point of view, even I would say uh, digital marketing is making its way, but yeah, uh, we have to keep some strategies uh, of in a traditional manner because people are still looking at uh, multiple <clears throat> uh, options before uh, opting for something. The next question comes from Devanand who is uh, uh, who is asking for your inputs on uh, approaching an enterprise customer mm -hmm. or particularly when he has to uh, go to a, a CFO's office I mean how to uh, how to approach for a product which is meant for CFOs okay okay see I think um, when we approach a CFO we, we need to uh, kind of look at uh, you know what are his priorities right I'm pretty sure um, I think you would you would uh, kind of look at uh, you know what is their you know, balance sheet, right? I don't know how many people do that, uh, but uh, you know uh, we do that. You know, whenever we go and meet with the CFO, we kind of look at their annual, um, you know, um, annual reports, and then you know this kind of thing. So we kind of understand, you know, how is their business doing, right? What kind of LOBs, uh, what kind of businesses they are doing, and how each of them is doing, and then which market units or countries they are present. Uh, what are their, uh, you know, broader objectives on a longer term? So I'm pretty sure every every company would have this three-year, five-year roadmap, right? What they want to achieve. So I think knowing this is going to help uh, a long way, right? Because you are right away aligning to, uh, you know, what the customers want, right? And then specifically, you know, uh, a lot of these topics uh, or objectives the, the company wants to achieve is tied to their, you know, uh, revenue, or uh, in, in one form or another. So, um, you know, understanding those and then tying up to what you are telling them, right? But what you are trying to position as a platform or a solution, yeah, that's that's how I think you got to, um, you know, start off. Because you know, uh, if, if, you, if you're not doing this, then straight away, you know, they they will conclude that you know you're, you're not talking my language, right? So this is the, this is what I would suggest. Learning the customer's language is the key. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, uh, we talked about uh, you know uh, digital go to market in the whole session mm -hmm. where uh, how to you know leverage cloud. Uh, another question comes on the security elements. The how cyber security mm -hmm. play a role in this digital go to market strategies because. Uh, we, uh, because uh, we are talking about data integration. Mm -hmm. But where the cyber security uh, comes into the angle of digital GTM? Okay, so I think uh, this has become a very common topic now, uh, the security angle, right? So security, in, uh, basically, uh, you know, we got to look at in different uh, uh, different buckets. One is, um, you know, security about your uh, data, right? Security about your data when you try to store that in in a cloud environment. Second is, um, you know, a lot of lot, um, lot of these customers would have a hybrid environment, which means that they might still have some applications running from on-premise. Some of them could be on cloud. So uh, how do you make sure that the data that is being 
transport between you know this on premise to the cloud is secure so that's another angle and the third angle is basically you know uh, security about your customers data right so now that uh, gdpr basically uh, you know in europe uh, it is kind of uh, a big thing right how you comply to this gdpr without the consent of your customers you cannot let um, you know their uh, details given to anybody else uh, and i think in some form or way uh, every single government will actually uh, specify the, the, the this gdpr requirements right so i kind of take this into three areas so the first one is basically how do you you know uh, make sure that your data is safe in a cloud environment so i think this has been addressed through uh, many iso uh, certifications that every provider right they will actually go through their uh, in fact every company have their own internal teams hacking teams you know which basically uh, kind of um, you know go through uh, this certification and make sure you know their their entire environment is safe from any malicious activities and also uh, there is a external audit uh, also that that by a third party uh, on a periodical basis uh, with all the updated information about you know how you protect your data including physical security right because it is a data center so this uh, i mean companies invest lots of money in this area to get themselves uh, certified with the you know these iso certifications soc 1 soc 2 certification so i think that kind of gives you the guarantee right that uh, your data in the cloud is safe it is not shared with others and it, it is against any malicious activities so that's one second one over the air you know how you can uh, how how safe is your data when you transport your data from one on premise system to the cloud or between cloud to cloud so uh, i think now uh, again this is a very matured area i would say uh, people actually have different mechanisms to protect the data during you know uh, the transit uh, by using reverse proxies you know security uh, certificate based security etc so uh, it is almost impossible to uh, you know um, even if you tap in between it is uh, impossible for you to get uh, you know uh, the scrambled data so there's no way you can get it without a proper um, you know security um, certificate for example so i think that's the second one that i would say there are mechanisms and uh, you know means that it is um, you know you can uh, ship this data very safely um, so the third one on the on the sort of customers like consumers or customer data i think um, every company is now uh, complying with this right so even our company you know we actually uh, comply to this gdpr requirements so um, we explicitly unless and until uh, the right. customer uh, says that his data can be shared so you know we will not do that so i think there are uh, reports that uh, we need to furnish on a periodical basis um, you know to you know, to the gdpr so um, i think uh, this is an area that will grow in the next uh, you know uh, months and years uh, you know every country will have some form of variation of this requirement so i hope that kind of addresses the question thank you uh, thank you so uh, the, with this we comes to the end uh, we have a couple of more questions but uh, <clears throat> at this time as time passes by we have to put a stop here uh, Ashok, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, sharing your experiences and your learnings with us. And uh, thank you everybody for uh, for joining us. Please do leave your feedback and see you next time. Sure. Thanks, Vibor. Appreciate uh, you know giving the opportunity. I hope the session was useful. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Bye.